How many would say this morning, we're probably living in our last days. Yes, amen. You look around us, you watch the TV, <laughs> read the newspaper. Right. All you see is problems. Mm. Some days shootings everywhere. Now the wildfires in Maui, Hawaii. Yeah. Earthquakes. The Bible speaks of famines and pestilence. Yeah. Families against families, brothers against brothers, mm. sisters against sisters. It's all adding up, and I'm a firm believer. I don't think it's going to be much longer mm. before the Lord comes back. And Amen. I think Brother Phil did good on the song this morning. Amen. Amen. And Tuesday night we were discussing the uh, coming back of the Lord in the, the book of Daniel. And like I say, I don't think it'll be very long. Yes. But this song is about here for now. Mm. We're just here for now. At last, a few drop, but not for long. Amen, brother. To the words. I was fighting, brother John, about doing it live or playing the studio version. Mm. And my wife talked me into giving out a bread. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I this morning, I desire your prayers. Mm. Bless you.
Amen. And that's absolutely true. Um, I'm not doubting that at all. I know Christ is coming. Every day that we um, flip the calendar over to a new day, we're one day closer to His return. And He knows exactly when that day is. Amen? Maybe today. It may be uh, next week. It may be 10 years from now. Maybe a 100 years. But we're certainly closer than ever before. Amen? Amen. And uh, my prayer is, even so, Lord Jesus, come. I would love for it to be today and for him to take us home. Let's take our Bibles and turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 7. And uh, the text in our bulletin is verses 25 through 28. And I want to share with you a message saved to the uttermost. Amen. Saved to the uttermost. Most of the time people look at this passage and they make, make a mistake and say that uh, God's able to reach to the furthest part of the world. To save to the uttermost. And they say, I'm glad that he's able to save to the guttermost. Those that were way down there. But it, it doesn't mean that. It means a complete, perfect salvation. Nothing lacking. To be fully and completely like Christ. Isn't that a wonderful hope that we have? Not that He just forgives us of our past sins, but He makes us into His own likeness. What a great salvation that is. And I hope this morning God will speak to your heart. And I hope also that you'll find hope in Christ, that Christ will make you what you ought to be. Amen? Hebrews chapter 7, let's add a verse that's not in your bulletin. Look at verse 24, and we'll read through the remainder of that chapter. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood, wherefore he, that is Jesus, is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercessions for them. For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. Amen? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we just thank you so much for an opportunity to gather to gather freely in, in this nation to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. We appreciate the freedoms that we still have as your children. And Lord, we pray you'd help us not to waste this time, this opportunity. Lord, you know all of us. You see exactly what's going on in our heart and our mind. You know where we're at in our relationship with you, our walk with you. You know our needs. And you are the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the chief shepherd. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would call out to your sheep this morning and, and call them to a closer walk with you. That you would give them spiritual food that would help them in their journey. That you'd give them hope. They may see this salvation that they've received by faith through grace. And Lord, the potential and what you offer to them is far more than that we've experienced. And Lord, I pray that you call us to higher ground. Lord, lead us to the rock that's higher than we are. And help us to desire hunger and thirst after righteousness. Lord, help us to want to be more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray, Father, if there's any in this service that are not saved, that the Holy Ghost of God would deal with their heart in a powerful way. Lord, that they this morning would realize that you are calling their name. That this is the day of their salvation. That this is the time they should respond to you and come and receive you as their Lord and their Savior. 
We pray especially for Christians that may be struggling. Encourage and strengthen them. Lord, help them to come to these altars and lay their life down afresh and anew. And say, God, use me and get glory uh, from my life. The glory that you deserve. Lord, have your way in this service and accomplish your will. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The goal in saving sinners, if you read the Bible, is an entire, full, complete salvation. You may have seen a church sign uh, riding down the road, a full gospel church. Have anybody ever seen that? A full gospel church. What they're trying to imply by that sign is most people don't experience the fullness of the gospel. I'm not saying you can in that building, that denomination, but the implication is there that many people receive forgiveness of their sins and they're born again, but that's it. They don't make any more spiritual progress after receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Some have this hope that they can get into heaven just by the skin of their teeth. You know, I I just don't want to go to hell. I just just want to get into heaven. That's the wrong approach to Christianity. And that's the wrong mindset to have in the Christian life. And that's not the will of God for you either. It's just to barely get in by the skin of your teeth. Amen? Amen. God is not calling us to a carnal salvation that leaves us weak and frail in our faith. Don't you believe it breaks the heart of Jesus that suffered and bled and died on Calvary to look down upon his own children that he has saved and redeemed and see them weak and struggling in the mire and not getting anywhere, not advancing, not growing not becoming more like him. I believe it's heartbreaking to him after paying all that he paid to see us not doing well in our spiritual life. Don't you believe that? Amen. Not like a roller coaster uh, salvation either. Where, you know, I don't ride roller coasters because I'm a little scaredy cat. But, uh, no, I'm, I'm supposed to be honest, right? So, <laughs> I couldn't lie to y'all, but the truth is I'm a little scaredy cat. I don't like that feeling when your stomach feels like it's in your throat. I was on a, 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 Mary, a Ferris wheel one time and it was going up. And I, I said to the guy when I came down, get me off of this thing. He wouldn't stop it. But, you know, you're doing slowly doing well. And all of a sudden. You come crashing down and uh, I guess uh, most of you know what we're talking about. The best illustration probably is the Ferris wheel. You go around and then you go down and you go up and you go down again. Uh, And that's defining to to most Christians. That's my life. I'm really doing great. Oh, I'm doing terrible. Oh, I'm doing great. Oh, I'm doing terrible. None of us think that that's what Christ wants for us is it not an up and down and in and out he wants to see consistent spiritual growth how many of you feel like sometimes your christian life's like a ferris wheel you know sometimes i picture myself like the children of israel wandering in the wilderness 40 years the same old vicious cycle When what God really wants us to cross Jordan and enter into the promised land. Amen. That's what he desires. We need to grow and become more like Christ. The Bible says this is the the God's design for salvation. Listen to these verses. Jude chapter, uh, chapter one, but Jude verse 24. There's only one chapter, so Jude verse 24. Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling or stumbling. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. He said he's able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless with exceeding joy. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I want want your entire being 
set apart for God's use only. By the way, if you want to pray the will of God, this is the will of God, your entire complete sanctification. That's a good prayer to pray. Lord, sanctify me wholly, spirit, soul, and body. Amen? And Paul says, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's hoping and praying for an entire, complete salvation. Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Notice verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be, to be, what did he predetermine? To be conformed to the image of his son. You get that? He said, I'm working all things in your life. And I foreknew you, and what I, I determined beforehand is you to be like Jesus. I don't know of many of us that can raise our hand and say, a Preacher, I, I think I'm like Jesus. In spirit, soul, and body. He goes on to say, to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among Many brethren. He's our oldest brother, our best example. And what does the father want? He wants us to look like the son. Amen. Look at John 17, verse 21. I'm just kind of giving you an idea of what the Bible says. This salvation that he offers is. John 17, verse 21. That they all may be one as thou, father, art in me. And I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. You see how important that is? We've got uh, loved ones looking at us. And we've got neighbors watching us. And what they're not seeing is Jesus. And, and if, if, if Jesus is going to be lifted up in our day... He's going to need some followers to begin to behave themselves like he would behave him, himself if he lived in your house with your neighbors or worked on your job. Amen? Amen. If you have John 17, go ahead and look at verses 20, uh, 22 and 23 with that. He says, and the glory which thou hast given me, I have given them. That they may be one, even as we are one. Look at verse 23. I in them. You say, preacher, how in the world are we to live this kind of life? He said, because I live in you. I, I am in you. I can accomplish this if you'll trust me. I in them and thou in me. That they may be perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and thou hast loved them. As thou hast loved me. I'm just trying to get across to you this morning with these verses. And by the way, I'd say to you, there are many other verses that say, this is what Christ really wants. He wants us to receive him as our savior and then grow to Christ likeness. Paul put it this way in Ephesians chapter four, that we may reach the fullness of the stature of Christ. He wants us to be mature believers, not carnal but mature believers sanctified in every area of our life. And you say, preacher, how in the world is that even plausible? <laughs> I know I've known the Lord. I've, I've tried to be obedient to the Lord. But to be honest with you, I'm far from being what the Lord wants me to be. How is that even possible? Well, Hebrews chapter 7 gives us some indication of how that's possible. Amen. And I just want to take a little bit of time with you morning this morning. Meditate on this verse with me. Notice, first of all, the person of this verse. Wherefore, he is able also to save them. Who's the he there? It is Jesus. Amen. That's clear in our context. Go back a little bit in Hebrews chapter 7 and you'll see how that Jesus is the one that's spoken of here. It's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ as our great high priest. Look at verse 22. 
By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. It is it's saying Jesus is our high priest. He's the one that is, is interceding for us and he ever lives. So it's important this morning that you are mindful that the one who's able to change you to be utterly like him, completely like him, is Christ and Christ alone. That doesn't mean that we don't have a role to play. But the power that transforms us, it comes from Christ. Amen. The power that enables us, it comes from Christ. Amen. The power to make us like Christ, it comes from Christ. Amen. Right? Is that true? Yes. What does John 15, uh, 1 through 7 teach us about who is the vine and who is the branches? Jesus is the true vine, yes. the genuine vine. And we are just branches attached to him. We bear fruit because of our union with Christ. Without that union, you and I are just dead branches, unable to bear any fruit whatsoever, to the point that John says, without him, you can do nothing. Amen? Amen. So who's able to save them to the uttermost? Jesus. And only Jesus. You see, so often when we come to Christ and we're saved, we think that's the, it, that's the end of it. That's all that God has desired to do is to pardon our transgressions, to erase the sin debt, and then just set us free in the world to live the best that we can live until one day He meets us again in heaven. Is that your idea of what Christianity is? That is not the Bible teaching on Christianity at all, is it? Remember, the Bible says that we are to live out this Christian life the same way that we came into it. Right? What does Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6 say? As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Live in Him. The same way that you received Him, is the same way that you live for him. Amen. If you'll go back and remember the time before you met Christ and your lost condition, your hell bound condition, when you were a sinner, unsaved, what did you do in order to become a new Christian, a born again child of God? How were you saved? Well, you say, well, preacher, well, I was saved because I joined a church. Can I, can I plead with you this morning? You're not going to find a Bible verse that says you're saved by joining this church. How did you become a different person? Saved, individual, follower of Christ. Well, I got baptized and I started giving my tithes and, and I quit doing some bad stuff. Can I tell you something? You're not going to find a Bible verse that says that's how you gain eternal life. Right. You get baptized and, you know, give some money to a church once in a while and stop doing bad things. You know, that's not found anywhere in the Bible. Amen. In fact, there are people that are still trying to be good enough to get to heaven. Good enough. If you were to ask them, they'd say, I'm not a bad person. I'm not a bad person. But what does the Bible say about that? It says there's none of us that's good. No, not one. We may not think that we're bad, but compared to Jesus, we are awful. Amen. We're worse than bad compared to Jesus. Amen? Amen. What does the Bible say about how we gain eternal life? Look at Titus 3 and verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, what does that mean? I don't have this new birth because I started doing good deeds. I started feeding the hungry and, and clothing the naked. And because I did all this good stuff, then I have eternal life. That's not what the Bible says. It says not by works of righteousness, which we have done. Listen to me. But according to his mercy, he saved us. Listen, what does mercy mean? Mercy means I deserve the wrath of God 
but he didn't give me the wrath. He stayed his hand of wrath, and he gave me grace instead. He mercied me. If it weren't for his mercy and his grace, none of us would be saved. Amen? You can't get to heaven by being a good person. What did Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 say? It says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is no, none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He said, there's not another name that affords salvation to you. None other. What does that mean? He is exclusively only the Savior. No one else. <clears throat> Zero. You say, preacher, why are you uh, emphasizing that? Because you'd be surprised how many people are trusting in this person or that person or this individual or that individual. And they say, oh, I love Jesus, too. You can't add Jesus to it. Amen. It's only Jesus. In other words, Buddha can't save you. How many agree with that? Is that right? Buddha can't save me. Is that a right? No, he can't. He needed a savior himself. Muhammad could not save me. Joseph Smith of the Mormon faith could not save me. Baal or Molech or Asheroth. None of those false gods could save me. Amen? Amen? No one can save you but Jesus. You say, preacher, that's your opinion. That's not my opinion. That's what the Bible said plainly, right? Amen. Neither is there salvation in any other. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Amen? Amen. You'd be surprised that people are trusting in someone other than Jesus. Listen to me. And you need to put your name in there too. Tommy Caps can't save me. I can't say, you put your name, you can't save yourself. If you keep trying to save yourself, listen to me, and I'm not meaning this in a harsh way, but this is the truth, you will split hell wide open. Because what are you doing if you're trusting someone other than Jesus? Whoever that is, you're rejecting Christ, the only Savior. Are you getting that? Is that, is that clear? So when we talk about this Savior that has saved us from our sins, we need to realize that He alone is the one that can continue to deliver us from sin. Only, listen, He saved us in the beginning. Listen, this is what the Bible actually teaches. And He is saving me now, and He will save me. Amen. It's not that I just came to the altar and I was saved. We have this mindset. I, I, I preached a message one time. Are you still saved? And I'm not implying by that that you lost it along the way. But so many people said, well, I got saved when I was 12. And then that's the end of it. Nothing else in their life ever changed. They're the same person that they've always been for 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later. Is something wrong with that? Is something wrong with that? Absolutely. Remember what Jesus said in John 14, 6. Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. In 1 Timothy 2, verses 5 and 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. And, and, and listen, and Brother Bob, some of you others know this. I could go on and on and on with verse after verse after verse after verse that says only Jesus can save you. Amen. Well, if that's true about the new birth and salvation and making me a child of God, guess what? It's also true about the rest of my Christian life as well. He is able to save us entirely, completely, Fully, perfectly. And I just want you to, uh, you know, 
I think sometimes even, even some of you who have grown to some degree and you reach some measure of spiritual maturity, it's easy to stop there. Because you look at how far God has brought you and you almost are satisfied that you're so much more like Christ than once, what you once were, but not realizing that there's a long way still to go. I love what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3. If there was ever a Christ-like man, it was the Apostle Paul. How many would agree with that? Amen. I don't know of any other Bible character that lived completely for Christ as the Apostle Paul did. Do you? But I find him stating in Philippians chapter 3 that he is still forgetting those things which are behind and reaching for, pressing towards the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He's saying, I'm like the Olympic runner, and it's, it's a really close race, and I'm straining to get across the line first. I'm pressing to win the race. That's what he's saying. Now, does that look like somebody that's passively just sitting by the wayside saying, well, I hope I come in first. Or does that look like someone who's satisfied where he is in, where he is with Christ, or how he's, how he's fleshing out this Christian? No. This one thing, he said, I want to know. Yeah. The powers of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. Yeah. I'm just saying to all of us, I'm myself especially, there's much more about Jesus that we need to know and learn and live. What's at stake? The world is looking at us and they want to see something different. They want to see what Jesus does in a person's life. That's right. The difference that Christ can make. You know what's sad? Most of the time if you said a, a Muslim man or a Buddhist or, and a Christian or put any other religion there, you watch their lives, most of the time you can't tell much of a difference. Isn't that sad? Yes, because the man who has the Holy Ghost of God living on the inside of him should shine brightly because that's the truth. It's not veiled in some darkness. Amen. Here's a man who knows the living God and the Spirit of God has indwelt him. We should outshine if everyone else. Sadly, we're not shining as brightly as what we ought to as believers. Amen. I think because we're just glad that we're not lost. Or well, we've grown some. And we don't realize that there's much more that Jesus desires to do within us. Amen. Amen. So who is going to make me more like himself? Jesus is. Then notice also the people. He said he's able to save them them who to the uttermost that come unto God by him. So he's not talking about the unsaved world now. He said those that have come unto God by him, he is able to take those believers and transform their life so that they can completely mirror the likeness of Christ. I want you to know that mankind has a responsibility. By that I mean an ability to respond to God. Did you hear what I said? We all have a, we have a role to play in this. Here's the Savior who is transforming us. But we're not just over here sitting by twiddling our... We are responding to what the Savior wants. As He deals with our heart, we respond to Him. As He moves on us by His Spirit... We yield our lives to Him. There's a role for us to play in this becoming like Christ, just like there was in salvation. Amen? Amen. I was lost before I knelt in the altar and said, Lord, I accept you as my Savior. I believe on you. Save me. And guess what happened? Jesus saved me. I became a new person, a different person, when I asked the Lord to save me and I received Christ into my life. That's the moment of my conversion. My salvation. Guess what? The same thing continues to happen throughout the Christian life. We're dealt with by the Spirit of God. 
And then we're challenged to repent or respond to God in some way. We respond, and, and as we respond, he makes us more like himself. But you and I have a role to play. Think about this again. God calls out to each of us and he rightly respect, expects a humble response. Amen? Amen? Don't forget, we're dealing with the creator. And when God speaks to you, you know what the response ought to be of every single one of us? A humble response. Amen. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. If you're here this morning and you've not received Christ as your Savior, as to this very day, your response to Jesus should be, yes, Lord. Not an excuse, not, uh, you know, well, well, I do this, or I do that, or I believe this, or I believe that. The only response is, yes, Lord. Remember in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus went to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. And this is what Jesus said to the crowd that day, repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, what, what's the expected response to that? Yes. That is to turn from my selfish way of living and what I'm trusting in to Christ and then Believing the good news, the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? And I said that again to emphasize that we must continue to respond to His will. In Acts 17, verse 30, the Bible says this, And the times of this ignorance God winked at. Talking about the, the, the idolatry in the past, before Christ came into the world. But He said this, Since Christ came into the world... But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. You see, God is saying to all humanity, all unsaved people, Amen. I'm not asking you to repent, I'm demanding it. I'm not offering you eternal life, I require it. You must repent. Amen. It's an act of obedience to repent. And believe the gospel. Amen? Amen? I'm just trying to say again to us. This is the call when we're first saved. <laughs> Repent. Believe. And then what did we do? We repented and we believed and we were born again. But God continues to work that same way in us. Amen? He doesn't want us to stay where we are spiritually. How dare another year pass off the calendar and we look at ourselves in the mirror and we're the same as we were last year. Don't you ever get tired of that? Does, doesn't that ever grieve your heart? Never bother you that you're making little progress in your spiritual life? Well, Christ wants to make you to make more progress as well. Amen? Amen. And He is able to change you. What is God's desire? Look at Matthew 5, 48. That great sermon on the mount. Listen to what Jesus said in that sermon. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. You say, preacher, wait a minute. You mean that God wants me to be a perfect Christian? Amen. Yes, that's what He wants. Amen? By the way, that's what you and I should be aiming for. That, sh that should be our desire. Look, if we're shooting for perfection and we don't reach perfection, we're going to be a lot closer to being like Christ than if we're just shooting to be a little bit better than other people we attend church with. Amen? Maybe, I just, as long as I know a little bit more Bible, or as long as I can do this, and, you know, I'm better than those folks who don't go to church. That's, that's not what we should be aiming. Amen. If we're reaching for perfection, how many of us could grow, radically grow, if we realize, hey, God wants more from my life than what I'm giving him. He wants me to be perfect as the father in heaven is perfect. Peter added to that in 1 Peter 1, 15 through 16, when he said, but as he which hath called you is holy, 
so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. He said, he, the one that called you is holy, so you ought to be holy in all manner of conversation. And that word conversation means what? Behavior or the way you live in this world. Your attitude. Your spirit. Your speech. Your walk. Every how you treat your wife, how you treat your children, how you treat your employee, how you interact with unsaved people, how you fellowship with the brethren, every area of your life, he said, I want you to be holy in all conduct of life. I, I, I just want to lift up that goal before you again, because it's so easy to settle down and say, you know what, I'm saved. At least I'm not going to hell. What a difference, though. We can make in the world if all of us hungered and thirsted for being much more like Jesus in every area of my life. Spirit, soul, and body. Amen? Amen. Well, concluding, notice the prayer. That's a high challenge, but we have a holy God that's able to accomplish that. Amen? Amen? How is that even possible to be perfect, to be holy in every manner of life? Because we have a living Savior who is interceding for us and who will always intercede for us. Isn't that great news? That, that Christ did not finish his work, as it were, at Calvary and then just sit down and that's the end of it. He's in heaven right now lifting up your name before the Father. Saying, Father, please get that truth across to them. Please stir his heart. Open up his understanding to that. Help him to see there's so much more to this Christian life than what they've ever experienced. The joy, the abiding joy that's available. The fruitfulness that's available. The power that's real. Some of them are just barely making it through and there's so much more that they could have opened their understanding to that. Amen? Amen? I want you to be reminded that His offering is an eternal sacrifice. His blood provided everlasting forgiveness. He's also interceding on your behalf. That's a great salvation, isn't it? Let me close by reminding you of something we read in the New Testament in, in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 18. If you want to turn there, look at verse 19. So here's Christ, and this is His desire, that we are all holy and we become just like Him, Christ-like in every area of our life. What a great goal. What a high calling. That's a good thing. How would you like it if I said that this morning I'm presenting to you a Savior that says you can have forgiveness of your sins, but you've got to continue mucking around in sin the rest of your life? I'm not interested in that. I want freedom from sin. Amen? I want victory and power over the enemy. That's what He wants for you as well. In Matthew chapter 18, listen to this verse. Verse 19, he said, again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, they shall ask, it shall be done for them. You say, preacher, why would you mention that? Here's Jesus praying for us. By the way, the Holy Spirit's interceding for us as well. Romans chapter 8, amen? <laughs> but you know when the real changes take place? Is what you, when you and I get on the same page with Christ and we are... Asking the same thing from the Father. The Spirit of God will deal with you about something in church. You'll recognize it yourself. You know it's wrong. Jesus is interceding for you. And listen, when you get on your face and say with a, with a, 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 a heart that has no deception, no hypocrisy, but a genuine desire, Lord, change me. This is unchristlike. I can't keep acting this way. I can't keep behaving this way. It is wrong. It is sinful. Deliver me. Guess what you've just done? You've just joined in with the prayers of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Can I say something to you? That prayer will be answered. Yes, it will. You say, preacher, well, I need a little bit more evidence than just 
Matthew 18, 19. I think that's in the church context. Well, how about if you're in Hebrews still, turn back to Hebrews chapter 4 and look at those last two verses again in Hebrews chapter 4. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He said, listen, when you're struggling with sin and temptation, I feel for you. It, it breaks my heart. I, I'm concerned about you. I'm touched with that. Look at verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. Why? That we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Isn't that something amazing? Listen, I, I'm telling you, I have experienced this promise personally on many occasions. Struggling with a sin, can't get victory, though I craved victory. I was miserable on the inside. I came across these verses and I said, Jesus, you know this is a weakness of mine. I hate it. I want help. And you know what? Immediately I was delivered from that. You know why? I believe because he's interceding on the same thing as well. Let me give you one other verse real quick in 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Look at verses 14 and 15. 1 John 5 verses 14 and 15. I do want to ask you, you, you think about this. He's praying for you. If you get on the same page with him, there's no telling how much will radically change in your life. Listen, especially when you yearn for it. Especially when it's a must. It's something that you don't even want to eat food over. God, I have to have this. It can't keep going this way. I'm saying it cannot just be a passive interest. It has to be a passionate desire. You know, sometimes the truth is we really don't want to be delivered from some sin because we enjoy it too much. Right? Listen to 1 John 5. Are you all there? Verses 14 and 15. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. Isn't that good? If I pray and I'm in line with his will, I know this. I know he received that prayer. I know it didn't just fall to the earth. I know it reached the ear of God. And I have confidence it does because I'm praying exactly what he wants. His will. Amen. Now look at verse 15. And if we know that he hear us whatsoever we ask. We know that we have the petition that we desired of him. Amen. Amen. If you're looking for some verses on prayer and promises concerning prayer, I, I strongly urge you to write those two verses down. Amen. That, that's why when you're praying in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Lord, sanctify me holy, Amen. spirit, soul, and body. You know who hears that? God hears that. Amen. And you know what God will do? He will answer that. Now that may take a time, some measure of time in your life, but I promise you this. God hears and answers prayer. Amen. Amen. Get on the same page with him. If you're here this morning, I want to encourage you to come. If you're lost. Say, well, Brother Tommy, I'm, I'm religious. I have my religion. Please don't go to hell over religion. Make sure that you have a real relationship with Jesus. Did you hear me? Make sure you have Jesus. If you don't have Jesus, when you die, you will go to hell. And I don't want to see you go to hell. Jesus does not want you to go to hell. Amen? Amen. By the way, aren't you glad we can tell people Jesus does not want you to go to hell? Amen. So humble yourself and come and call upon the name of the Lord and be saved today. Would you do that? If you've never received Christ, will you ask Jesus to save you? If you ask Jesus to save you, He certainly will. Amen? Amen. Come this morning, agree with God. If you're cold and indifferent, 
that God would warm your heart and set you ablaze again to do His will. How many of you have been cold and indifferent at times in your Christian life? I, I, I hate to admit that I have been. I, I worked uh, one time, I was working you know, almost 80 hours, asked Brenda a week, uh, early in the morning till sometimes early in the morning. The night that Je- Jenny was born, our second daughter, I didn't get home till 2 o'clock in the morning. I met my father out the door and said, uh, we didn't have cell phones back then. That's how long ago that was. I was still working off horse and buggy. <laughs> and he said, uh, Brenda's at the hospital. She's, she's having a baby. And I just brushed him off. And I said, Brother, don't, don't mess with me. And he said, I'm not messing with you. If you want to get up there, you better go. Went uh, straight up to the hospital. And sure enough, Jennifer was already here. Stayed up with her all night. Went to work the next morning. But you know what I was doing that during that time? I was ne- neglecting Jesus. And I was getting cold and indifferent. In fact, getting involved in things I shouldn't even been involved in. Why? Because I was not spending time with Christ. Not desiring to be more like Christ. I had gotten caught up on trying to make money, provide for my family, while not really providing for them. Amen? If you're cold and indifferent this morning, come to Jesus. Ask Him to warm your heart. If you are saved and you are strong in the Lord and you're doing well spiritually... You know what, it might be good for you just to come this morning and say, Jesus, I thank you for how far you brought me. But I want to admit something. I've got a long ways to go. Don't let me slow down. Don't let me just sit down. Help me to be passionately pursuing as the Apostle Paul was. To learn more and more and more about you until you call me home. Amen? Amen? See, all of us could respond to... Christ ever lives to make intercession for us. Amen? Amen. The lost could come and say, Jesus, save me. And because He lives, He can save you. The cold heart can say, Jesus, warm my heart. And Jesus certainly would do that. And the strongest of us could come and say, Lord, help me never to be satisfied with what I know because I still need to know much, much more. Amen? Amen? Let's stand for prayer. Our Father in heaven, We thank you for this morning and opportunity, Lord.